But often what we see is something that does not lead us anywhere near that capacity. And so we have this little uh, enigma or riddle here in Proverbs 30. What is his name? What is his son's name? He has seven names. No, there's ten. The Kabbalah says there's 72, and I saw a book online with 100 names. And so some author thinks there's that many. I saw also 2031. So those are just a, a few random numbers out there. And again, these can all be false, but they can't all be true. And that goes with the name. We can rule out most of the titles here and recognize them as titles. Some of them are helpful and some of them are not. And then the names. You look over here on the right column and see that most of these are just very Here, you see some of the titles. They're Hebrew number and uh, transliteration and how often they occur. So these are basically things that we see that are covering up what uh, is originally there and very obvious and straightforward in the Hebrew. One of those titles I feel we can get on our vocabulary pretty confidently. It has some baggage that we don't need. And furthermore, it's a complete extra. We know how to say anointed one in the Hebrew. And we know how to say it in English. How many other languages do we need to have in our arsenal? Unless you're trying to write a song, you can do without this one. And uh, let me just show you a passage here. In Acts 11, 26, we read in the King James, and the disciples were first called Christians in Antioch. Well, they were not referring to each other as Christians. Never in Scripture do I find an occasion where one believer to another believer by this title. And in fact, if you look at the lower part here, you see it says that. You can read that, that highlighted word there for us. Mem, Shin, Ket, W, Mem. Mashiachim. That doesn't sound anything like Christian, does it? So I don't know how that got in there, but we can take it right back out. Now, anointed one, is that specific enough? Well, if you just said anointed, it certainly wouldn't be, because as you can see here, many of the seers were anointed, if not all of them. Every mediator at the beginning of his every king was set aside through this was a very common thing in the culture, and so therefore being anointed was absolutely as ununique as any character. Who was anointed as a seer, as the king, as the mediator. There's only one that fits that description of all three. He is the anointing one, and so I find use for that reference. All right, transition here. Um, we see in the first verse that there are two words that are not translated. In Hebrew, there are seven words. And those of you who read the Hebrew, this is Alam and Tau. Who is that referring to? Why is that left out as, as unimportant and untranslated? We're going to see that. I didn't plan to put this in the presentation, but it just showed up several times, and I just highlighted it. The figure in a... Look at these names. How, what percentage of these do you believe are hiding the ineffable name? If you were to go back two or three thousand years and pronounce these names to Moshe himself or King David or whoever you want to go see, go find Abraham and talk to him. If you could get in a time machine and go pronounce Zip. But if you go down, I'm just skipping through here, filling in all the blanks at once. And so we see all but one of the names that I put in this column, all but one contains some form of some name or title that connects with 
our maker. So there's again a number of different names and titles that have been uh, offered. Some of them are more general, some are more specific, some are more helpful. But as we saw on the calendar yesterday, finding the correct name for the Creator, just like finding His worship name depends on finding the right calendar, finding the right name depends on finding the right alphabet. We know that there are numerous um, alphabets out there, versions of, you know, you got the early Semitic, the middle Semitic, the late Semitic, you've got the Aramaic and the Phoenician, you've got all these different versions of alphabets, and then we see that the Greeks essentially took the alphabet and flipped it, just kind of like the world calendar flips the calendar. You've got, instead of reading from right to left in Hebrew, Allah, Bayit, Gamadalat, We've now got the Greeks reading from left to right. Aleph, or Alpha, Beta, Gamma, uh, Delta. They just took those letters and flipped them around backwards and, and did their own thing with them. And the interesting thing is there were several uh, letters in the Hebrew alphabet which didn't readily lend themselves to these letters. And we're going to suppress their inherent historical and we're going to assign the vowels to them for our usage. And that's the alphabet that we have. And the interesting thing is, those letters which the Greeks took and applied a vowel sound to are the letters that we see in the Tetragrammaton. In other words, the, the letters in the original Hebrew alphabet, which have been tampered with, are the letters which constitute the ineffable name. So that's a layer that we've got to get through. I haven't done that yet. There's a lot of things that I don't understand. I'm not trying to pick on anybody, but looking through these next few slides here, with Dothan and Dothayim, whether you've got the um, Yod here or not, it's just given the same number in Hebrew, but it's spelled differently. So that's one of those scribes wasn't counting his letters correctly, didn't catch it. We see that Samaria is named after Shemer. We see that Abiyah and Abijah are the same name. Aram equals Mesopotamia equals Syria equals Assyrians. P can have an F sound, S can have an S H sound, even though there's some of it in the alphabet that could do that. Here, as Tamoa has rendered three different ways and given the same number, not a very common word, so it's not a huge deal, uh, but it does cause us to put our antennas up and question some things. Beth Shen, Beth Shen, N equals M, E equals A. You can get these notes from me later if you want to go through more slowly. But I want to point out here that there is intentionality and there is perfection in the word that we have. This is a just a snapshot of item into 20 section starts every word of every verse with the letter for that section. So one explanation for all these differences where P equals F and N equals M and there's no explanation. Maybe they were just not paying attention. Um, you be the judge of that, but there's a lot going on here that I've not gotten completely to the bottom of. Is that it? Well, that happens to be Ramallah. It's about 30 miles north. That's not the only place he put it. In Yirmiyah 7, 12, and 14, he speaks of Ayyar Shalom. No location. So, more than one place. And uh, I'm more concerned about him putting his name on my heart than any piece of geography. My house shall be called a house of prayer. Your house. Your house is left empty. And so his name is not anymore in that place had a change of status. This is a, a shot of the uh, Yashia scroll from found in Kuberman. Here's a zoom in. You can see the yod hey wow the tetragrammaton right here. And I just want to show you. Here's trying to draw a close 
will be created here, and some are interested in other things. So this is the Tetragrammaton, one of the uh, scripts. We've got uh, the number of it here is 3068, yod heh and uh, it tells us here how to pronounce that. But uh, many people have made an effort to clarify and expand and, and uh, redirect. Alpha. Somebody. Uh, sorcery and amulets and record companies. You see here, uh, we've got the yod heh wah -Hey on top. What does it say on the bottom there? Perdition. Somebody's playing games. This name, this name is not magic. It's not a lucky charm. There's, there's power in this name, but it's not power that we can manipulate and abuse. Our creator and maker is above that. He doesn't play the games that the enemy plays. But uh, just a random question here. How do cowboys from Hollywood herd cattle. Are these sounds you heard on TV? On the Western show? I'm just asking. Is this an echo of Pharaoh's heart, 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 heart question? Does somebody out there know something? So these are not names. Whether you use them or not, I hope you recognize that. And this is not a name, it's very curious that this, in the concordance, this is uh, G2424, but what does it see when you look that up? That it comes directly from H3091. And what does it say it should be pronounced as? Jehoshua. But you go directly to H3091, and uh, what does that mean? Jehoshua. Now, notice this. We have Y A H O S H U A apostrophe, meaning we end abruptly there. We have the same thing repeated here. So these transliterations are identical as far as I can see. And yet the words they're translating are different. Can you see the difference? They're not the same word. One is Yahusha and one is Yahushua. I counted it up a couple days ago. This word occurs 218 times in the King James. 216 of those occurrences are this right here. Yahusha. And two of them are this right here, Yahushua. So both are scriptural, but one is far more common than the other. And so pronunciations based on the letter J, again, cover this in a second. The letter J is just a letter I with a tail, created for differentiation or distinction to, to note the difference between a, a hard I and a soft I, because that's the only distinction there was. Letter J is just a couple hundred years old, but whether you use it or not, you can get Yahushua or Joshua. Same word, different pronunciation, one's hard, one's soft. Um, scripture did not distinguish that. Uh, a priest a couple hundred years ago came up with that innovation to make a distinction. But here's something to think about, that shua that's added on there twice. That root there is H7769 to cry. Well, did our Messiah cry? He didn't open his mouth, he was dumb. So I don't use that ending generally. So here's the, uh, the word again in Judges 2.7, we see it both ways. And the people served, there's all the time hiding again. Yehua, all the days of Joshua, age 3091, and all the days of the elders that outlived Joshua, age 3091, who had Seeing, I will talk about it again, all the great works of Yahuwah. <coughs> and here it is in the Hebrew. You see, I will talk about it, but notice this. This is one occurrence of the Yahushua, 
The verse that makes it very clear that this guy right here is the same as this guy right here without the Shema. So it's just a, a variation in spelling right there in that verse. Whatever name or title we're using, there are several ways that it can be misused and uh, whether we have established that we have discovered the, the perfect spelling and pronunciation, we can do much to minimize or eliminate some of the overuses. And I know people that pray that overuse the name or the title and it just makes me disgusted. You know, you don't go up to your friend and say, well now Fred, Fred, we need to do this, Fred, we need to take Fred this, Fred, your friend, and go Fred over there, Fred. So why would you throw in the name that often? That's not using it reverently. Don't pour it in 60 times in a one paragraph prayer. I don't believe that our Father is honored when we do that. Don't use any profanity and don't be faithless and doubting and say you're his child. Don't disobey him and say you're his child because all of those are taking his name in vain. Now, talking about vocabulary and clearing up our speech, here's some examples of things that we shouldn't be saying. If the scripture says, make no mention of these things, we have the goddess Sirius, the pagan sirens, the company with the swoosh, all these root words, every weekday name, months and planets and other uh, deities and goddesses. And uh, we'll get back to that in a little bit here if we get time. Now this is one I want you to put your notes and pay attention to. 2 Samuel 5, 20, we read that it came to Baal Perizim. Now it's referring to this place by its name, but it's discussing the occasion of how it got that name and the reason for it. David won a war in this place, and so he said, Yogi Wawe had broken forth upon my enemies before me as the breach of waters, and therefore he called the name of that place. Yodhi Wawe Perizim? No. Here it is in the Hebrew. We've got uh, a prefix here. Bayet and then Bayet Ayin Lamed Bayet Perizim. And we see that we're talking about Yahuwah, out of Tower again. And because of what he did, we needed this. I'm going to break it down for you here. I want you to, to remember and consider this. Okay, here's the verse again with the numbers in there. And here's the first number, H1188, Bell Paris him. What it means, possessor of breaches. And it refers us back to 1167 and another number there. This one is master, possessor. It's a pretty generic title, generally used in pagan deities, but here it's clearly applied to the Creator. And then age 65, 56, to break or cause a breach. And so putting those two together, you get age 1188. And uh, looking at this chart here, this is the transliteration. This is just a little more correct pronunciation or clear. And this is how we would say it in English. So, if we can refer to him by that title, I guess anything goes, right? Well, not necessarily, but again, there are many who go by that title. And so we need to be more specific. We need to be more consistent. And that's what I'm gonna call you to this afternoon. Three things, take this home with you. We need to be diligent about getting to the bottom of these layers. We need to be diligent about being consistent with how we talk. And we need to be diligent about um, making sure that we are clear on who we're talking about. Okay, here's an example of the, the name Yah, and everyone has heard the name Hallelujah. So if you want to say Jehovah, then I ask you to say Hallelujah. Just be consistent. And um, 
do that with all the words that you use. Okay, this is important. This is the history of the letter J. Tenth letter of the English alphabet used to be an I. They just added a tail to it to uh, give us the, the distinction of which sound it had. You kind of divide a, a variable dual letter into two separate ones. Um, Okay, the next one here. Well, if I and Jay were using it changeably uh, for a while until somebody decided to make this distinction, it says 1524 gives the name of the one credited with that. So, does anyone know how to say I have in Spanish? No Spanish speakers here today? It's yo tengo. And so, if someone has a heavy or hard accent, it can be yo tengo. Spelled the same, just pronounced a little different. And, and the same thing here's uh, now in German, it's jetzt. Spelled with a J. You know that uh, Johan starts with a J. So forth. So there's a number of uh, different ways of saying it, regardless of how you spell it. So I'm going to skip down here. We're kind of out of time. Let me get to the point here. Um, this is one that that happens. Oops, I just hit that slide. One that happens pretty frequently, it's, it's the Tetragrammaton and A6635 together, Yehuda Tzabayot, the the uh, Yod of Armies of Hosts, it says this phrase, Yehuda of Armies is his name, at least 20 times, and the KJV is probably more than that directly in the Hebrew. So there's a good one there, but Again, I'll be clear how you pronounce it. Well, I want to say today that again, if you can get rid of some of these titles that we don't need and uh, get a little closer to it, what we need to ask ourselves is what is his character? Because that's just as integral a part of this as how to pronounce his name. We read this quote here. When therefore the children of Israel asked, uh, what is his name? That's Moshe saying, what am I going to tell him? They meant, who and what is this mighty one of whom you speak? What is his character? What are his attributes? What does he do? In short, what sort of being is he? And so, um, we see that Messiah says here, I have manifested thy name unto the men which he gave thee. He doesn't say, I have pronounced it. He doesn't say, I have spelled it. He says, I have lived your name. I have shown it to them through my actions. I have demonstrated your character. I have enhanced your, rep your reputation. I have been you to them. That's what we need to know. Who is he? Look at his son. We can find out. Whatever characteristics we see in Messiah, these are the filling out of the I am of his father. As we look at the life of Messiah and listen to his words, we can hear him saying, I am rest for the weary, I am peace for the storm tossed, I am strength for the strengthless, I am wisdom for the foolish, I am righteousness for the sinful. I am all that the neediest soul on earth can want. I am a blank check for every believer. Call upon me. Give me the name that you need, and I will fulfill it for you. Obviously, we've got to do that consistently. But it's not I am, period. It's I am fill in the blank. And Hagar did that. And with no disrespect, this was a female slave foreigner. And she had an experience with the Most High. She was watching her son die of dehydration. He spoke to her. He showed her a well. He saved their lives. And she said, you are the one that sees me. And that name stuck. If she can give him a name, you can give him a name. And so all of these can be useful to us. He'll answer to each one of them. And until we can learn how to spell and pronounce the pure language, 
that will do. The name is a strong tower. He is our strong tower. And it's not a tower of rocks that we've got to run to. It's a tower of spirituality that can go with us everywhere we go. And when we are under his cover, we are safe wherever we may be. And whatever situation occurs to us. And we can trust in him. Yahuwah is our strength by whatever name. And our Redeemer by whatever name is still as sweet. Yohanan told us, beloved, now we are his sons. We don't know what we're going to be, but we know that when we see him, we'll be like him. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You are going to manifest his name just like Messiah did. And so in part, I want to ask you, if you're going to use these words, uh, you got. if you're not going to use these words, you've got to get creative. If you're going to eliminate this one here, then you've got to eliminate all these that go with it, all of its forms, and find replacements. What are we going to say instead? And that's not a dishonorable thing, but if you're going to quit saying cereal and agriculture and fortune, you're going to have to work on them. But use qualifiers. If you just say the boss, we don't know who you're talking about. But when you say the Lord of all creation, the God of all comfort, the, the Father of love and life, we know who you're talking about. So when you want to refer to him, use any name you want to, but make sure that you're using a descriptor. This is an opportunity to praise him. This is an opportunity to clarify who you're talking about. Just take a second to talk about it. Nobody's going to mind. We can say the supreme and and patient Redeemer, or we can say the Supreme and Patient Lord, we can say something that's going to tell everybody that's listening to exactly who you're talking about. I'll end there. I hope that, uh, Father willing, we can have another conference and I can come and give you the last word on this. But until then, it's about relationship. He's on your side. Praise His name, whatever it is.